Again, my name is uh, Pat Bentley, and thank you for coming. Um, the, the class that we did, and we're going to talk a lot about it, it, it basically was a summer immersion program. Um, and, and what we have is students who seem to be very, very afraid of math and didn't really like a lot of different things. And so we started to think, why do so many college students need remedial math? So we started to think about this concept. and. Why do they continue to struggle even though they start to at least get credit and pass some of those stuff? Why do they move on to the next class and it's like they didn't even take the class before that? <laughs> just the thought of taking a math class for some people just stresses them out. Um, my wife has a girlfriend. She's 44 years old, been a paralegal for 20 years for a law firm. She wants to become a lawyer. She can't get out of remedial math. She's at Davenport. She's the fourth time she's taking this class. She absolutely hates it, doesn't see the point of it, doesn't know why she needs to take it. What do I need to know all of this stuff for? Why is or what is this big deal about having to take these math classes? And I'm sure those of you who are professors, you hear this all of the time. I'm going to do this. Why do I need to pass Math 107? Or why do I have to take Math 98? And it just causes a ton of anxiety and a ton of stress. <laughs> so we hear this all the time. High school teachers, why did they put the alphabet in math? Well. Apparently, somebody a long time ago decided this was just some form of punishment to humans, and we're just going to put the alphabet in math. We thought that was pretty funny. Before um, we start talking about the program that we did and what we tried um, with the students, we just wanted to kind of highlight some of the problems um, with remedial math. And the website right here is where we got all of this information. Um, but it's, you know, there's a, I think this is a pretty high percentage of people that need remedial math. Um, this is all first time undergraduates in community colleges like here. Um, over 50% of students need some sort of remedial class, whether it's math or reading. Um, minorities are affected more by this, 30% uh, of white students. Um, require remediation for minorities. It can be in the 40s. Um, this uh, also talks about the difference between minority students and white students. Um, but this is talking about the ACT. It says only 25% of students who took the ACT met the college readiness benchmarks in all four areas. And those benchmarks vary depending on the uh, subject. There's For math, the ACT college readiness benchmark is a 22. And then for the other sub subjects, they can be higher or lower. But um, only 25% of all students met those. And for minorities, it was 5 and 13. Remediation is expensive. So who, regardless of who's paying for the class, whether it's um, the, the student themselves or whether they're getting grants from uh, various governments, it's around $2.3 billion each year for remedial, for remedial classes. And these are all things that you're supposed to know once you, before you leave high school. Um, remedial students are more likely to drop out without a degree. In those remedial classes, there is a very high percentage of failure. So this statistics here said that about in the remedial math classes, people fail them at about 50%. Um, and this here says that if 25% of remedial students at com community colleges end up earning a degree within eight years. Uh, they're not getting degrees in the same um, percentages as other students. 58% who do not require remediation earn a, bac a bachelor's degree. But for remedial students, it's much, much lower. So you're at a disadvantage <laughs> if you need remedial math. Um, and this is uh, the 2014 um, data for just numbers of enrollment in the remedial courses here at CC that we got from John. And if you did the quick math, you can see if 50% of them are going to fail, that's right. not good. 
and only 17% of them are going to actually get a college degree, according to the statistics. <laughs> so the program was actually created by, um, his name is Tony Baker. He's a GRPS board member, and he's a professor at Fair State University. Uh, when they started to do some different studies, they noticed that these students who are coming in, they have a huge dropout rate at Ferris. Incoming freshmen, about 20% that take remedial classes end up going on to get a college degree. So what they decided to do a couple years ago was create a summer program for just that. You go on campus and you take all of your remedial classes in the summer stay on campus, you learn about the college community, you learn about the campus, and then you go and you take your, your regular classes in the fall, and they found out that the success rate was much higher. They started to get, they started to retain anywhere from 50 to 60 to 70 percent of those students instead of just that 20. Well, what became an issue was not a lot of inner city and low income and minority students were willing to make that trip. So what Tony Baker decided to do was create a program. It's called the Summer Success Bridge Program. These are students who are juniors who are going to be high school seniors who had low levels of math, ACT scores, and low reading scores. And they would come in the summer in between their junior and summer year, or junior and senior year, and building on those different proficiencies and building on those different schools taking math classes and reading classes and so forth. Um, one of the things it did was it enhanced their admissions credentials so that they may qualify for admission to a post-secondary institution of their choice. So that was the design of the class, was to get them acclimated to some college classes, get them some credits, get them some help, even before their senior year. So this might improve their ACT score. It might help them get in there into whatever college that they're looking for. Um, enhance their knowledge of core subjects to improve the ACT scores for post-secondary admission. So one of the byproducts of that was hopefully they can improve their ACT score. Um, they're going to get nine credits for this summer program. Uh, build on their strengths, navigate the higher education system. Part of one of the courses was an introduction to college living type course. Um, what are all of the aspects that you're going to incorporate in college. What are the things that you're going to run into? Why do people leave college even if they're doing well with grades? Is it, you know, they're handing out credit cards and all of a sudden you go into debt and then there's many things that they just start introducing on there. So they were enrolled in four different classes. Math 110 was the fundamentals of algebra, four credits. I think it's equivalent to the Math 107 that they, you have here. Um, read 106 was a college reading program, and then they got two credits for the college study method. So it's nine different credits. Uh, to get in here, you had to meet some requirements. They had to have a 2.5 cumulative GPA, um, and this was important. Their ACT score for math had to be between 15 and 18, and they had to have a reading ACT score that was less than 16. Um, once we kind of got asked to do this, one of the aspects that was really important to this program was building relationships with the kids. And that's a little different than what you can do kind of in a college atmosphere, but we had an opportunity to really, really get to know the kids and even the other teachers that we worked with. Uh, we planned several different excursions. We went on a canoe trip out to the White River and collected and analyzed a bunch of data. Um, we went tubing. That was just fun. But uh, we went trip to a cemetery to look about cultural history, and we did some math stuff there. They went to FSU just to introduce, see a college, some of them for the first time. I mean, they've walked downtown and seen GRCC, but a college like Ferris University. So, <clears throat> I don't know who that is. Um, before we started teaching the class, <laughs> yeah. I was not aware. 
Before we started teaching the class or really started planning what we were going to do, we went and talked to two John Dersh um, because as he explained in the introductions, he uh, Pat had him in class and so he went to him and we talked to him about how college classes are structured, um, what types of things people do as far as grading systems and grading scales and do you grade homework, do you not grade homework. Um, we talked to him a lot about a textbook, he gave us some advice about you know, just different ideas for textbooks and then lent us several. We ended up choosing one that he recommended. So the first thing that we did was try to get some information. And then based on that, um, <clears throat> we decided to um, inform students in advance of test dates and due dates of important things. Because we um, are high school teachers and so, you know, we wanted to treat it more like a college class. So we gave a very detailed syllabus, outlined the entire thing and made sure they knew what was going on. Um, and based on what he had said, we decided to do um, you know, the breakdown here, the written test for 400. Um, an idea that he gave us was homework quizzes. So the students are given a homework assignments and then when they come in, they're given a homework quiz. They had a number of them and we took their best 10. So there's a lot of incentive there to keep doing well um, on the homework quizzes and they took the homework very seriously. Um, we did 100 points in reading activities that we'll go into some more detail later and projects as well were a big part of the class and we'll talk about that in more detail a little later. Um, we distributed weekly agendas to students. Um, you can go ahead and show it. The students got at the beginning of the week um, a very detailed um, explanation of what problems they were going to have to do, what they had to do to prepare for the next class. Um, what the homework quiz would be about. Um, any, like the project one was due on the 18th, so the, the students were just very aware of what the expectations were in the class, which was different for these kids, because these kids were in high school. They were between their junior and senior year, so having this kind of outline for them uh, was new to them. They, they were not used to that at all. Um, Daily homework was assigned and assessed with graded homework quizzes. I already talked about that. Um, and we didn't just use the textbook. We used a lot of additional teaching materials and resources and activities and other things that we would do in our high school, <clears throat> in our high school classes as well. Go ahead. Um, once we started talking to each other, uh, Aaron said, I, I, I really want to know what everyone knows. We have to figure out, we, these are students that we don't know, we only have eight or nine weeks of them, we have to figure out what they don't know. And once we talked with John and figured out what kind of level and what book we had, we decided that we would pretest them in six different areas. Okay? You can see them there, fractions, decimals and percents, exponents, order of operations, integer operations, properties of numbers and expressions and solving linear equations, okay? Essentially a lot of pre-algebra skills that you need to have to be successful in that Math 110 class. Um, students earned a percentage in each of those six categories and where they were considered proficient in that category if they scored a 75% or higher. So on our pretest, we had divided it up exactly the way we wanted, gave it to them, and if they met 75% in that particular area, we considered they were proficient in that area. Um, six weekly assignments were given that targeted needs according to the pretest and were individualized to each student. And we're going to get into more detail with this, but essentially if you didn't get 75% in a particular area, we targeted you individually as you need some help in this area if you're going to be successful in this class. Because not everybody needed every particular area. So if they didn't meet that 75%, some made, some covered all of it, some covered none of it, some were all kinds of in between, and we individualized it for each student. Students who did not need all six assignments targeted to pretest, they were given extension assignments that were not in the curriculum. Okay? Um, we just went into some different resources that we had that we knew what we were going to cover and what are they not going to see. We want them to improve their ACT. We want them to improve their math skills. They're obviously proficient in these areas. They're probably going to do pretty well in the class. You can see based on their pretest. So 
while the other students were doing their pretest stuff, we gave them extension assignments that covered things that weren't in the in the curriculum, some you know roots and rational stuff and all kinds of different things. Um, we, in our experience from dealing with kids in the high schools, um, the students, they don't look to the book as a resource. They, they go right to their teacher or to a friend, but they're, they struggle with using the book as a resource. There's some information, there's some examples, but they don't know how to use it. So we wanted to help them learn how to read the book, how to use the examples um, so that they could have some reference materials and we were hoping that this, like if we focused on this skill, it would help them not just with this material and in this class, but in future math classes as well. Because we thought maybe that skill of teaching them how to read the, ma the math book would transfer to whatever class they were taking. Um, so the kids took a, they took a three credit reading class as part of the program and we worked with a woman named Rose Maher. She's not here today, but she is a high school English and reading teacher. And she taught them how to read the book. We leaned on her a lot because we're not reading teachers. And so she knew lots of different strategies. And we picked um, a section in the beginning of the book on geometry. And she went through it with them in class and taught them all kinds of different strategies for reading it. So she taught them things about annotating a textbook, how to mark your text, how to underline and highlight. Um, how to take notes, how to focus on vocabulary. She taught them how to, um, uh, they made, they're called foldables. So if you have several different formulas, it's kind of, it's like an interesting way to make flashcards so that you have like a picture with the formula um, that you need to do and some examples. And one that we used a lot in this, and we continue to do now, I have my kids use this, is the use of sticky notes. So when they go through the example, you get to a problem, before you even look at it, you cover it up with a sticky note. And you read the information, you try to do it, and then you can uncover it. So you can find out for yourself if you're learning it as you go. And our book had um, skill practice problems, so it had example problems, and then it had skill practice problems with the answers at the bottom, and she taught them to just go through the section and just cover up all the answers right away. And so they could read the book and they could use their reading strategies and then go back and check their um, understanding of it before they started doing their homework problems. So the six pretest assignments um, that we were mentioning earlier, um, they were given as reading assignments, and this um, was a good chunk of their grade. Um, and they were structured in such a way so that the students were required to use the strategies that Rose taught them. So their, their first assignment, um, if you scored a 50% on one of your pretest categories, you were given a reading assignment that went with that category. So if you didn't do very well in integer operations, for example, you were given a section of the book to read, problems to do to practice, and then the students had to use a reading strategy turn in evidence of that reading strategy, and then write a reflection of whether or not that strategy worked for them, <coughs> whether they would do it again, or if they would try something differently next time. So, go ahead. So this is an example of one of the, um, one student's reading assignment for one week, but it does have on here um, their entire pretest breakdown. So this just, we took the names off, it's just student A. Um, scored not proficient in all of the pretest categories. So these were the scores, I can't reach it, but these are the scores that the students got in each of these categories. And their reading assignments were, because um, it was indiv individualized to each student, so they were all labeled. So th this student's first reading assignment was to do F, which went along with one of these. But this particular one was his fourth reading assignment, and so he had to do section B. So he had to, um, these are the questions on the pretest that corresponded to it, if you wanted to look at that. Um, there was two parts to the pretest. There was a calculator and a non-calculator part. That's what you're looking at here. So the student had to read these pages, do these exercises, and then it says, in addition to reading the section and using a reading strategy and completing the exercises, this is something that we tried one week. They had to write out two of the problems in here as if they were examples in the textbook. So they had to, um, 
write all of the steps and then write in words what they were doing with each step just as if they were examples. So that they were like verbalizing um, what they were doing as they were doing it. This is another student's, um, this is also their fourth reading assignment. This student was proficient in three of the categories but not in these. Um, so this student did these three for the first reading, or the first three reading assignments, did those three based on the pretest. And then the extension assignments, this was one of the extension assignments. So the one section in the book that we did not cover that summer was a, on functions. And so they had a little more choice. So there was different objectives and they could choose some of the problems to do from each objective. Um, and then again, in addition to reading the section, they had to demonstrate use of a reading strategy and then reflect on the usefulness of that strategy in a written, in a written paragraph. And this is something else that we tried as far as um, reading was concerned. Um, their assignments, when they got their assignment list, they, it included reading the next section. So if you were doing section 5.1, you had to do those problems. Um, and then in addition, you had to read 5.2 and um, take notes, use examples, and try the skill pra practice problems. So they had to kind of, before they were taught it, they had to read it and then demonstrate that on their homework. Um, another thing that we wanted to do was to make math as relevant and interesting as possible as we could. Um, that's one of the things being a high school teacher that we always kind of struggle with is how can we get everyone up and doing something, collecting data, analyzing data, doing something with it. We ended up dividing the course into five different units there. Um, linear equations, systems of equations, exponents and exponential functions, polynomials, and quadratics. Um, in each unit, students completed an activity, uh, many of them which required them to collect their own data, analyze it, and so forth. This is actually hiding underneath the still where I'll, we had them hit some dart guns and we'll talk about more later, but we thought it'd be fun to play Hunger Games with the, with the Nerf dart guns, so um, I lost, of course. You, she shot me, but it was fun. So for the five different activities, the first one we did was slope of a staircase activity, which of course Mr. Dirsch took care of that one for us, linear equations. Um, we tried to organize these in the, using the scientific method. Okay, we would propose a question to them. Are all staircases built with the same slope? And then they hypothesize. Okay, well, let's go then and figure out if they are or not. Let's go to stairwell A, stairwell B, stairwell C, measure one at home, measure one here, come back with the rise and the run, and let's see if all staircases are built with the same slope. And what was actually kind of interesting is it turned out they didn't even have the same slope within the same staircase, which I thought was interesting. But for the systems of equations, we did a parking garage activity where we sent them out on an excursion and they had to find out three different parking garages that have different prices and find their intersection points. Create equations from, you know, it's a dollar and ten for dollar ten for every half an hour, but you get the first hour free. What does the equations look like? It's being piecewise. We didn't focus too much on all that stuff, but find the intersection point and where do you want to park in Grand Rapids? and so forth. So they had a lot of fun with that. Bouncing ball activity, exponents, just rebound heights, and it's an exponential function. So we spent a lot of time watching them try to drop a ball and watch it bounce five times and quickly mark, and it, balls were going everywhere. But it was a lot of fun. They did that. Gas price activity, um, dealing with polynomials. We just went online and just um, fun activities you could do with polynomials and somebody did a gas activity so we looked it up and turned out you know, the, it's very cyclical and if you just take a cross section of it or take a domain of several months you can curve fit it to pretty much any degree polynomial you want and, and we ended up finding one that was a really good fit for last year from I think February to July was a really good th uh, third degree polynomial 
and it, it was really, really close. So we had them agonize all, or organize all that data. And of course, we started the question, um, can you create a mathematical formula based on gas price data? Well, of course, most of them said, well, yeah, otherwise we wouldn't be doing it. But that was their answer. So I was like, I'm going to find something where that answer is no. Can't find a math formula for it. But eventually, you can. Dark gun activity, another one of um, something I did here, um, shoot for your grade. Now, we, CC had a little more extravagant stuff than that. But our dart gun activity was basically you get one shot to shoot a dart, and it has to go in the container. And you have to use math and, and quadratics and, and all of that stuff to go with that. So and all in all, we, our idea was let's do something where they're collecting their own data. And we had time to do this. Not a lot of time during the school year can you sit down and spend six hours at Brenda's house Right on the dock in the summer after 10.30, and we're there on the boat coming up with gas price activities. But we had an opportunity. It was a lot of fun. So um, Here's an example of the bounce activity. It just propose a question. When a ball is dropped, it doesn't return to the initial height. Is there a mathematical pattern that will determine the height after each bounce? Or is it random? If so, what's the pattern? So we had them state their hypothesis, conduct the experiment. Um, and so forth. And this is just more of the stuff that they had, just kind of scaffolding through what we need to do, analyze the results, make a conclusion, extension questions, how it leads into an exponential equation, and they can curve fit it. started with your interview. What do you think are your greatest strengths? My greatest strengths? Yes, your greatest strengths. What are my answer choices? What do you mean? My answer choices. You know, A, B, C, or D. There are not any answer choices. Oh, I understand. In that case, I choose C. You choose C? Yes. I choose C. My fifth grade teacher told me to always choose C when I did not know the answer. Oh, it sounds like your fifth grade teacher really prepared you for your future. <laughs> Moving on then. This job will require you to write proposals about energy conservation. Are you a strong writer? Yes. My teachers always told me that I write very good stories. I also like to write poetry. Well, we will not need you to write poetry or stories. We will need you to write proposals regarding energy conservation. Proposals. Is that like writing a persuasive essay? Um, sure. In that case, yes. I am very good at writing proposals. Every year at school, my teachers made me write a proposal regarding school uniform policies. I also wrote some proposals about banning cell phones in schools. Would you like to read them? No, I would not like to read them. If you get a job here, you will need to write proposals about energy conservation. Your proposals will need to include basic mathematical equations as well as scientific research. Wait. What is wrong? I am confused. That is not very surprising. You said I would have to include mathematical equations and scientific research in my writing. Yes, that is what I said. But that doesn't make sense. What doesn't make sense? <laughs> Math, science, and writing. They are separate subjects. I don't know if I can incorporate math and science into my writing. They are all very different. Well, if you work here, that is what you will have to do. This job seems very difficult. I do not think my public education prepared me to work here. Well, I have to agree with you. <laughs> I have one more question for you, though. Why did you think you were ever qualified to work here in the first place? 
Why are you looking around? You ask me a question, and I do not know the answer. So, I am looking for someone to think pair share with. <laughs> there is no one for you to think pair share with. Oh. In that case, I choose C. <laughs> I think I've heard enough. Thank you for coming. <coughs> So this video kind of highlights in a comical way that there's like a lack of mathematical communication skills, um, maybe not to this extent, but I know in our math classes in high school, the curriculum is so tight, there's not a lot of time for teaching the kids how to write, how to communicate their thoughts mathematically in a written report. So. Um, for two of the activities that Pat just talked about, they were um, required to write a report about them in paragraph form. And again, we went back to our reading teacher, um, <clears throat> a little too fast. We went back to our reading teacher and asked her if she would help us teach the kids how to write a paper like this. So we wrote, um, again on the boat, a sample report and Rose went through it and taught the kids how to structure their papers. So if you go ahead, like this is, um, it's not a perfect paper by any means, but this we just went through and had them, you know, we, the first paragraph is your introduction, your problem, your hypothesis, and then it talks about materials you need and procedures you used, data that you collected, um, and our reading teacher had them go through it and find the necessary information. So the kids read it and she says, where do you see uh, materials? Where do you see procedures? Where do you see data? Where do you see the problem? And so they, they could highlight it and then and talk about it. So the kids, we didn't send them in blind. So when we asked them to write a report, they had something to draw from. And if this is the second page of it, um, just another graph, um, explanations of what they're looking at in the graph, uh, equations that go with it, and then the conclusion. Um, the graphs that you just saw on that one were constructed using GeoGebra. Um, we taught the kids how to use it. We had, um, the schedule was varied every day. On Wednesdays, we had the use of a computer lab for um, a two hour math slash writing. They had math for a couple hours and then they had reading for an hour and a half, but then on Wednesdays we had this joint class where we went to the computer lab and they worked on writing their papers. So it was our math writing component where we worked together. Um, Rose created a very detailed rubric um, so the kids could use it to edit, edit themselves and they peer edit it before they were submitted and then we used that to grade their papers. So here's, a, here's an example. Um, they were given a point. This didn't show up on there. Um, but anyway, they were given, you know, each, you need a name, date, and title. You need a problem, purpose, question, hypothesis. Each one had a point total, room for comments. And so they could grade it themselves. They did a peer edit. And then after that, um, we gave them time to um, write a final draft before they turn it in and we graded it together. And here's an example of one of the students uh, activities. So this is um, one that we did on gas prices. So you can see um, we had the introduction. Again, it's not a perfect paper. There's a lot of this that's in first person and I think if we had to do it again we would talk more about how you know that's not necessarily appropriate for something like this um, but all the data they put in the table talked about what happened um, referred to the data in their text keep going um, and then here is the data in blue the, the points in blue um, was the data that they collected from last year's gas prices and then we had them predict what they would be this year based on inflation rates and things like that for gas prices so we taught the kids how to use this program to draw graphs for various ones because some kids chose not to do this one some kids did their write-up on their bouncy ball activity or um, their staircase activity so we had to you know teach them how to do all of this and they had to do um, two of them, and I think there were 100 points each throughout the semester. 
um, our results. We don't have a lot of students to go from. We're not pretending that we have all of the answers for how to deal with this problem. But our results, um, we started with 17 students. Six dropped for various reasons. Um, there, uh, there was some attendance issues. Some of the kids um, didn't realize that they had to be there four days a week for the entire summer and they were gone too much, had too many other commitments. Um, there was one, because there was an ACT requirement to get in of, what was it, 16 to 18? Something like that. There was a girl that had like a 23 on the ACT and was very bored in the math class and she just wasn't interested in staying. So six did drop out for various reasons and then of the 11 that stayed, um, this was our data. Next year they're hoping to get because the class was supposed to be 25, so they're hoping to recruit a little earlier and do a little bit better recruiting so that we have a full class of 25 next year and more data to look at to see if any of our methods were working. Um, so we're gonna teach a summer class again, and what would we do differently? Um, we both are teachers at City now. We were at Creston for a really long time. I was at Creston for 15 years. She was at Creston and Central for about seven or eight years. So we're very familiar with lower level students. But now we're at City. Um, a lot of the strategies that we tried this summer, we implemented at City this year, just so we can improve upon it. And we're starting to really like a lot of the different things that we did in that summer, and we're incorporating them into the classroom. Like, you have to read the next section. Like, we provide a unit plan that is for every student, even eighth graders, 10th graders, 12th graders. They all have a unit plan that's on there. Um, the pretest stuff, we're going to talk about all of that. So we tried it, a lot of it at City. One thing we did was we created a website so you can go and upload unit plans, you can upload assignments, you can go whatever that we did in class, any handouts, any anything on there, weekly agendas, all of that now is at that particular website. And students, who we always just say, I don't have a unit plan, go to the website and print it now. I don't have to keep extra copies of everything. Just go, you know where it is, it's on there. Sure, I have one for you now, but next time go to the website, okay? Uh, one thing we're going to do differently is on the homework quizzes, uh, include questions from the reading students were assigned to prepare for the next lesson. Because even at City, we, oh, I got to read the next lesson. We'll be good. We'll be good. And then it starts to dwindle. It starts to dwindle. So when I said, all right, I'm going to put a homework quiz question from the reading on there, they didn't believe me. So I put it on there, and they didn't believe her either, and they didn't know the answers. Well, next time everyone was reading it. Okay, so if we put homework quiz questions from the next reading on there, and and we sell it to them by saying, you know, anytime you're trying to learn something, be as prepared as possible. You have to be prepared, and that's where that whole concept of using the book as a resource. We still are fighting. I wasn't here that day. What do I do? You have a unit plan. You know what we did. Did you try and read the book? No, I figured you would just teach me later. No, stop figuring and start holding yourself accountable. And so before, they didn't really have an idea how to do it. So when we showed them how to read the math book, use it as a resource, they started to feel a little more comfortable with at least trying some things on their own for kids that struggle with math. Those individual reading assignments, um, are going to be given with a rubric so that they know exactly what's expected of them because we, we just kind of, I wouldn't say we winged it, but we, you know, we just kind of put some stuff together and we had this idea, if you don't know what is, your pretest was bad, then you, you got to know this stuff and then, you know, you do this and we laid it all out and they read it and they tried it and they did all kinds of stuff. So at City now, we're creating a rubric. This is what you have to do for these individual reading assignments and they were due every two weeks and here's your packet and we labeled it like a heart packet and a diamond packet and a spade packet and a club packet and everybody got their own packet based on their pretest and this is your responsibility you are to teach yourself get into groups right now here's all the clubs here's all the spades here's all the hearts here's all the diamonds you guys have something in common now you need to work together and teach yourself this stuff 
And again, we showed them how to do that. And the rubric is, is, was very nice for them. It's like, oh, OK, I need to under, show I underlined. I can do that. I need to write down all of the vocabulary. I can do that. I have to try all of the skill practice problems. I can do that. Here are the practice problems that I have to do. OK, did you show all of your work? Oh, I can do that. Okay, And so that's how we change that. Another thing that we want to try differently is, is incorporate Khan Academy in there. Um, we teach a Saturday morning class, also through Tony Baker, where um, Grand Rapids Public Schools parapros are trying to become teachers. But they aren't doing very well when they go take the basic skills test, because it has completely changed now to become a teacher. So we go in on Saturday mornings, and we're trying to teach them all of the math that they need to know to pass this basic skills test. And it's not the basic skills test anymore. There are matching cortic functions on this 40 question. It is completely absurd what they're being asked to do. So in a 10-week program, two hours in the morning, how do you take 40, 50-year-olds who haven't had math in 25 years, they're at a fifth grade level, and get them to equivalently have a 28 on the ACT? You're not going to be very successful on that without having them do a ton of the legwork on their own. So we just decided to, all right, we're going to teach you linear stuff this week, everything about linear equations. So we went to Khan Academy, put on our website every video that we could possibly think of that teaches you about slope and linear equations and tables and graphs and everything. Watch these. Here's the part of the book that we're going to talk about. Read it. Familiarize yourself with it so that you're not coming in blind. And we want to do the same thing with those reading assignments. If you're struggling in fractions, here's your reading assignment. Here's the how to do fractions. And here's all the practice problems. And here's how you can tell if you're doing good. And here's four or five videos that you should watch that could support you in that. Okay. One thing we definitely incorporated at City was a post test on their individual reading assignments. So they're going to take a graded post test that's based on their six individual reading assignments. And how that looked at City was, was actually really, really cool. The kids bought into it right away. You should know this, but you don't. So here's what you need to do. Here's us helping you every couple weeks, here, providing it. You're going to have a test on this. You're going to have your own personal test in eight weeks at the end of the marking period based on your individual reading assignments. Whatever they were. If you were proficient in everything, then your reading assignments were higher level extensions, but you're still accountable. You're still taking a post test on it. And it's going to be graded just like everything else. Um, so we want to try that in the summer. Just hold them accountable a little bit. At City Middle, we pre-tested 125 students. These are eighth graders in Algebra 1, just in fractions, decimals, percents, and integer operations. Only 24% were proficient in all three areas. This is at City, eighth grade. We went through the whole reading assignment process. And in eight weeks, without us doing really anything, they taught themselves everything. That proficiency went from 64% to 62%, just in those particular areas. For Algebra 2, we pre-tested 100 students in fractions, decimals, and percents, order of operations, and solving linear equations. Only 23 proficient in all three areas. That got up to 73% in those areas. Um, the extension assignments, we, we don't think we poorly chose them, but we want to choose them more thoughtfully next time. Like, what do we really, what is going to give you the most bang for the buck without going too far where they can't learn it, but really trying to figure out what is important enough that you're going to need for your next class, OK? A skill that you're not learning here, but you could probably teach yourself something. And what are you going to have for that next class? Do you have any questions? I think that's it. Do you have any yeah. questions? Go ahead. It was throughout the whole course. Okay. Throughout Did the whole that course. Not impact their like if they weren't skilled in decimals or fractions, that didn't impact their work in the rest of the course. We chose them pretty carefully. Like the ones that we thought they needed right away, we had them do those first. Um, 
So, but it's been impacting these kids because they are on their way to be seniors in high school and these are things that they were supposed to learn in the seventh grade. So it's been impacting them all along. Um, and a but lot of... You didn't of, notice that in your... You didn't notice that they were... Obviously they passed. Mm -hmm. uh, they passed even with not that remediation up front. Right. We noticed that they struggled in certain areas, but... Like, they, like I said, we chose them pretty carefully, and the ones that we thought were the most important, they did first, and, and they moved along as they went through. Right. Even at City now when we're there, when we run into, all right, so we're doing negative 2 plus 7, what is that? And I'll hear eight different answers, right? <laughs> Even after they just were proficient in that, 73% of them, it's like, remember the, the sent sign packet? We practiced all this, and we talked about this. So at City, we're constantly referring back to it. And, and during the summer, we didn't really get an opportunity. They were just kind of doing them. And I mean, we, we got into groups, and we analyzed them, and we talked about them. We spent a lot of time on it. But they were doing solving linear equations before they were doing adding fractions because we needed them to solve linear equations because we were coming up to other stuff. So it, it, we just kind of ch chose the order as best that we could. But um, in the end, we didn't give them a post-test in the summer, and I think it would have been we, I, we wanted to so bad. I can't believe we didn't think about it. We did. You said no. I don't think that's true. I'm kidding. No, I remember us saying, I, I wish we could do true. that. And then it kind of, kind of in the end, it just didn't, it didn't work out. But it would have, it would have been nice. It would have been really neat. I mean, when we did it, it was amazing. It was like, OK, we had them all labeled with their big packets. And they came in, and there were six packets. They came and grabbed their own packet, did their own test. Grading, it was not fun, but 12, 15, 18 different keys. And, Oh my gosh, you got to pull all the packets together. But in the end, I think they, they gained from it so much. And now they know how to use the book as a resource. Okay. Okay, I'm not the only human in the world to teach you this right in this moment. There are plenty of people that can help you. So we're just giving them resources as much as possible. And confidence, too. They started to build some confidence. Any other questions? When the reading teacher, did the reading teacher come into the math class to teach the reading, or was that part of their reading class where they learned to read math? We had a block set aside. Okay. Um, we didn't really talk about the schedule, but we math met Monday mornings and Tuesday mornings from 8.30 to 10.30, and then reading was an hour and a half after that, and then they had that little introductory to college course for a little while. It was four hours a day. But on Thursdays and Fridays, or Monday, Wednesdays and Thursdays, math only met for an hour, and then on Wednesdays, we had a two-hour math reading block. So at that time, she did a lot of the math reading connection. That was, and everything she did in that block, too, as far as reading, tied into what we were talking about in math. So it was really nice mm -hmm. to see the connection. You know, She did a bunch of research on gas prices, and the kids were reading papers about gas prices and how it's important. And here we are doing an activity where the mathematicians use this data to predict what gas is going to be like very soon. They just don't start pulling numbers out of a hat and hope they're right. They're not weathermen, right? So, and also like b both, both um, classes, all three classes were actually taught in the same room. So there was one room. It was it was down at, at Kendall, just down the hill, um, it, in the in the basement. They had a room. It, it was a classroom, and we had the kids were there for all four hours, and we it was very casual. We you know we'd be there during reading, and she'd be there during math, and. Um, and it was, I don't remember exactly, I think it was during the block, but if it wasn't, it might not have been, it might have been during the math class, I don't remember. We just thought it was really important for her to work with them to teach them how to read it because we thought she could probably do a better job than us. And, and when we originally, you know, got asked for this class, when I went and talked to John, I'm sure he can remember the conversation is, I, I never taught a math class before as far as college went, but I do know that, um, the reading of that math book, the, a lot of students who struggle with math simply just can't teach themselves. They just can't teach themselves math. So my whole idea about this was like, I am going to do everything I can to get these guys to teach themselves whatever it is, even if it's the most basic thing, eventually you're going to teach yourself something without anybody's help as far as an adult. Like, you might have a group of friends that you're working with, but ultimately, you have to be able to sit down and at least just try something on your own. 
and I think they're just deathly, I can't do that problem. They're already waiting for the next tutoring session. He, John Dersh is going to be in his office hours from 3 to 4. I got 27 problems and he is going to be working through them with me to get me ready to where they didn't, they probably needed three problems if they knew how to use that book as a resource. So we, I don't know how successful we were on that, but we tried our hardest to say, all right, well, where is that in the book? Show me in the book where it is. Let's talk about it. Let's read it together. So when we, when we had our office hours, we weren't answering questions. We weren't doing math problems for them. We were showing them where they could have looked, where and what they could have done to, to be successful on that. And then I'm like, did you ask Jose? Because Jose got it right. No? Well, Jose's right over there. He can help you. So just building that relationship community, um, it's, it's hard for them. It's hard for anybody. I mean, everybody wants immediate answers now. And there's only one person that can help you, and that's your instructor. And we tried to just get away from that as much as possible. And, and at the high school classroom, you do the same thing as much as you can. I don't know if I remember which book you end up using. We use the 098 book. Yeah. Yep. What you think of it? We picked it. We loved it. Well, we pick books too. We don't always love them. Yeah, I don't know if we loved it, but <laughs> <laughs> it was better than the Ferris's book. I will say that. I like the skill practice part of it. I think that's I, that attracted me to that. It was easier reading than the Ferris book. Well, that's part of it. You know, if you want students to read a book that has to be usable, mm -hmm. right? I found, yeah, I did find that. And, and it lent we're itself We're using too. it on Saturdays at our class where we were trying to prepare people for the basic skills test as well. It's just a basic algebra book. It's pretty traditional layout, but, but it's readable. pretty easy reading. It's easier reading than what we have at our high school algebra course. I'll tell you that. Our high school algebra book is a really, really tough read. It is. The, this one is a good read. So just incorporating that reading aspect to that in, in the classroom, we spent a lot of time at the beginning just practicing it. We opened up the book. All right, you were supposed to read this, but now we're going to read it again. Someone, you're going to read paragraph one. Let's talk about it. Let's analyze it. Let's look at this example. Let's cover it with a sticky note. Let's try the skill practice problems. Who had a question on number three? And who had it, you know what I mean? So we got to go through, oh, here's the example. This is the one that matches it. Let's go through this one, see how we did, let's try it over here, and just all of those things so that they could just get more comfortable with it. And, and it, I like, in the end, I like that their attitude was like, I, I actually feel like I could do this now. Like I could go to college and actually be successful and take a few math classes, and they're still taking math classes now as seniors, and I think four of them took the ACT again in October, and they showed you know, anywhere from one to three point gains in their math which is rare when you take it in October, because you have that whole summer gap. Usually anybody takes in October, they don't do as well as you would if you took it in June or in March, and they showed a two-point improvement just by, you know, probably just by continuing to, continuing to do, math, to do math in some way, but um, I think it just helps with the reading questions on ECT, too. They can just read math a little bit better, and the writing math was pretty fun, too. They enjoyed the technical part of it. Um, they got really good at it by the end. I don't say really good, but their original ones were, whew, that was fun to yes, read. Yes, they showed a lot of improvement. Yeah, a lot of papers. improvement. <laughs> <clears throat> Any other questions? So I understand that, that the credits could qualify for college, but does that also fulfill their high school requirements then, too, for some of those classes? No, they actually tried. They worked with, because all of the, not all of them, some of them were, most of them were Grand Rapids public school students. Some of them were from Comstock Park, I think Wyoming. Um, the program directors worked with the Hispanic Center to recruit some students. So they were from various high schools. And I know in Grand Rapids, they did try to work with the school district to get the kids some high school credit for these. And for some reason, I don't think that they could. But I know that they tried. But I don't think they ended up getting high school credit for it. But they did get the college credit for they, it, yeah, as long did, as they, they got a C. College credits. I think only one that won D. She didn't get the college credit for it. But even then, I don't think she tested high enough to be an acceptable for that class anyways or something. She was supposed to get credit for a lower one. I don't know. It was a pilot program. And in the end, he was, you know, they didn't start recruiting until March of this. So you know, they, they started to really get desperate for some different people. But this year, they've been recruiting all along. So we're hoping to get a good, solid group of 24 kids 
all within that range, all who are excited to be there, want to go to college, want to mm -hmm. get credit, and you know, just improve their overall resume as far they as their ACT to get, scores. Yeah, they wanted to get recommendations from the high school teachers to see if they were, you know, had to go to attendance records to see what the kind of work ethic they had because these kids, it's a free program. This is an incredible opportunity for these kids, and th there's room for 24, and a lot of them, six of them, ended up dropping out like I just don't think that they really understood the opportunity that they were getting to be a part of this to get all these free college credits so I think that they're doing a better job recruiting kids that we can actually retain that are gonna attend class every day that don't have you know they had one kid ended up leaving because he was going to Washington for the last half of the program, so I'm not sure why he started then. So they do need to do a little bit better job recruiting, and they are. Um, the Tony Baker and his assistant, um, her name is Jessica Cruz, and they uh, work, they run the um, Center for Hispanic Studies at Ferris State. And do they recruit just from that campus, or all of Kent um, County? All of Kent you, County. If you look, um, you ha one of the handouts is the, um, it's like the one page flyer and on the back it says our partners so um, highlighted at the bottom it shows like here's some of the places where they were recruiting from Grand Rapids Public Schools, Grand Rapids Urban League, the Hispanic Center, um, Kendall College so they were going to these different organizations to get and into the high schools to get students And they're also um, going to do a program in Holland. Same kind of program this summer. They're going to do one here that we're going to work with, and then one in Holland as well. Any other questions? Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, if you have other questions for either of our speakers, 